quote to begin with from Oscar Wilde. I found this in one of my old books from the, the teaching of the science of mind at the Atlanta Church of Religious Science way back in the day. And this was Oscar Wilde was on the, on the bookmark. And it says, keep love in your heart. A life without it is like a sunless garden when the flowers are dead. The consciousness of loving and being loved brings a warmth and a richness to life that nothing else can. And that is really an outline of a basic idea that is the, the, the core of what we're talking about today. I guess you recognize our guest practitioner, uh, Dr. J. Kennedy Schultz. I was very happy to have found him on YouTube this week. And so I've been playing around with it and listening a lot and and pulled out all my old tapes and CDs to start trying to add to and create more of an online presence for him. So I, I find it exciting. I don't remember him talking quite that much, but I think it had to do being transferred to YouTube, being transferred to here, and I can't talk fast enough to keep up with what that was, but that was that's what it is, and I can't think that fast, much less talk that fast. So we won't do that. But what we will do is know that that's now out there so you can at some time in the future take in those ideas because that was a rich, powerful treatment for the recognition of who we are and where we live. You know, every and who we are is this absolute individuation of the infinite power of God that is God, life that is God, creativity that is God, love that is God, all of those things. And that's what we're celebrating this whole month is the power of a balanced life, love health, prosperity, and creative work. Not in that order, but that's what we're doing. You know, it's, um, and it's, hard, it's hard to find any part of our lives that doesn't fit into one or another of those large categories, and that's why we do it. There was nothing handed down from God, you know, speaking out of the heavens, saying these are the four areas you should talk about. It's somewhere back there. Somebody figured out that most everything in life falls in one of those areas, so why not use those to think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So today we're talking about love and relationships. The, um, it's interesting that almost every minister, minister in their first talk ever is about love. We love talking about love. We talk about love all the time. And we talk about love in talks because, because we love to, and because it's so core to who and what we are. I gave my first talk about love in 1968 when I first became licensed as a, as a minister. And then um, my first talk in CSL, which was then Religious Science, or RSI, here at the Atlanta Church in 1994, was also about love, and it was called A Cosmic Giggle. And my theme was the idea that the love of God peeks out at us from creation in ways and times that often make us giggle. There's a great idea among uh, religious teachers that when you, when you feel the truth, you see the truth, and it goes, yeah, that's it. There's a little bit of a, often a laughter or a laugh or a chuckle or a giggle that goes with it. Well, I won't do that talk. I'm simply using it to introduce this one because there's a cosmic giggle that goes on wherever you are and wherever you live. I think aardvarks are a cosmic giggle when you think about it. My cosmic giggle was always my daughter's giggle. And she would hide from us, but she couldn't stand to be hidden too long. And every so, and then she'd start to giggle when we walk around to look for her. And as soon as I heard that giggle, it's like, yeah, she's fine. She's safe. She's not run off anywhere. I know where she is. I'll keep pretending I don't. And then she'd giggle laughter and she'd get louder till we finally found her. And she'd be so excited about that. It was such a, such a fun little game we played. Wasn't much fun when she did it in department stores and it disappeared completely. That was not as much fun, but most of the time it was a cool, good thing. See, and I think that's what the infinite does with us if we pay attention. I think we get these little giggles, these little appearances of the presence to us of exactly the fact that we are so embraced and, and bound up in love. One of the one of the, I've been reading a lot, a lot this week back at really to really basic stuff about mental science as well as religious science, and in reading Genevieve Barrent, 
one of the things that she just comes back to again and again, she was the only student, by the way, of Thomas Troer, those of you who know something or who I'm talking about. But she kept saying that my mind is a center of divine, act, divine activity. My mind is a center of divine activity. And that means the divine is the one thinking when you're thinking. Now, that's a little mind-blowing the first time you hear it. It's a little like, what? And we say about this teaching as we say about all teaching that we present, and that is we're here to prove it. We're not just here to talk about it and, and bow and nod and say, yes, that's true, and then go off and forget about it, but to prove it by bringing it forward in our lives. My mind is the divine mind. And when I'm really clear about that and thinking about that, I'm a little less, a little more hesitant about some of the thoughts that I have at other times. Some of the um, words that I say to myself about other people or about my own life and my own self. You know, very few of us would talk to other people the way we talk to ourselves. We would have a rougher time in life. Now, that's, that's true these days. People seem to not have much filters, so it's a lot more coming out at you of what they really think. And maybe that's a good thing. But the point here is, when we know who we are, and when we really settle into that, that confidence that my words have power, and how I speak, and what I speak has power, it is the very movement of my thought into language, into sound. And Kabbalah says that's how creation started. Was with the Bible says the word was first. But before this word, there has to be sound. So you bring your, your thought into sound, and then the universe says yes. Because it does the only thing it can do is say yes. So when we think about love, and we think about, am I loved? Do I love? Whom do I love? How do I love? Whatever we're thinking about that has a way of expressing and showing up. See, love is what we are. We are born as love. Because love is that energy we call God. Many people make that equal. Almost every religion talks about God is love especially all of the Christian versions, but in others as well. God is love. So if the activity of your mind is God's activity within your mind, then you must be love, and I must be love. And therefore I am my own beloved. My wonderful beloved teacher, Kennedy Schultz, did a lot of talks about love. I tried to find some of them. I didn't find more than one or two so far, but I'll find them. So here's what he had to say about love. The psychology of our modern world today is the psychology of escape from what we are looking for. That's why we're so crazy. Trying to go in two directions at the same time. Now, so then, love, we can say, is an activity that we are involved in giving or can be involved in giving, not a commodity that we need to be worried about getting. It is an activity. Before it is a noun, it is a verb, an active verb. Right? Now, Ernest Holmes further say, says that love is the givingness of spirit through the desire to to express itself creatively. Love is the givingness of spirit, spiritual givingness, through the desire to express itself creatively. And here again, the key word is givingness. All loving activity starts with giving. The cycle of exchange of love starts with giving. And who has to start the giving? The one who is most aware of the necessity of doing that. Now, many people sit around waiting for it to be given to them, and it never seems to be. And it's not because there's no one in the world that can love them. It's simply because they are trying to operate the principle or the law of love in reverse. And you'll say to many lonely, unloved 
put that in quotations, people, what is wrong? And we'll say, nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. We'll say, aren't you loving? Don't you have the capacity to love? I would if the right one would only come along. And the truth is, the right one has come and gone many, many times, and they have not recognized. You can't start loving for someone else, only for yourself. Now, the key is giving this. That starts the activity. The motivation is desire. We give because we desire to give. And the purpose, the reason we desire to give, is because we have an inborn, inbred need to express good. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. To express good, to express it in a unique way, and to give something into the universe. Now, in order to give something good, you first of all have to be aware that you have something good. That's the thing that most people are down on themselves. It is amazing, no matter how successful people are in this field or that field, or how many honors have been bestowed upon them, or how attractive they may be, in their deep heart, too many people feel that they are not complete within themselves. They feel powerless. They feel lacking. They feel that someday they will be complete, but not now. And the message of religious science is that if you were not complete, you and I, within ourselves, we would not be here because we are created by an infinite mind that makes no mistakes. Makes no mistakes. We are created by an infinite intelligence out of itself plus nothing else. And because we are created, we are also fully equipped to survive. And so it is. There's a lot of ideas in that. The one I want to pull, because it's the one that turned my life around when I first heard it from him, is that idea that love is not a commodity to be gotten. I had been running around, and still forget every so often and do that, <clears throat> that love is out there somewhere, and it doesn't belong to me, and i got to get it. So I've got to please you. So I can get it. I learned as a small child after my father passed away that the best way to get along in the world was to do what adults were wanting in order to get them to take good care of me or speak to me or love me. And I've spent a big part of my life playing that game. And it's a game and it's useless because I did not know where the love was really coming from. Have you ever fallen in love? I mean like head over heels. Just, you see that person, all you got to do is think about them, and all of a sudden your heart races, and your hands sweat, and you get excited. You can't figure out what to wear, and you, you know, uh, 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 all that kind, of, that kind of wonderful, exciting feeling. I was in love at one point, and I was, I was back living in Philly, and I'm, I'm going down the street to the dry cleaners, a very boring kind of thing to do. You have to get your dry cleaning. So I'm walking down to the, the dry cleaners, because I lived in the middle of the city where I could do that. I could walk to everything. And, and I'm, I realized at some point I was kind of skipping. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird for someone my age and size to be skipping down the street. But I was. And, and I'm sure some people looked and saw, oh, look at that. He needs his medicine or whatever they may have thought. But you know what happened was I realized while I was feeling all of that, it's because I was so caught up in that energy because I was going to get my dry cleaning so I could go meet so-and-so to go to dinner. And I was like, just, oh, man, it was so exciting. And I thought then, in my earlier years, I would have given that person the full credit for that feeling in me. That love that I was feeling, that joy, that excitement, that energy, had to be coming from them because I didn't have it till I met them. But you know, the truth is, all of that feeling, all of that joy, all of that energy is present in me to start with. I'm not feeling them, I'm feeling me. Because that's all I got. And you know, I learned with a little practice. I mean, that was a wonderful, fun relationship. It lasted about two months, and then the, the fun part went away, and we still are friends to this day. And the love is still there, but it's a different feeling attached to it. But all I have to do is think about that, and I can feel that energy starting to stir up inside of me. Hmm, yeah. When you fall in love, you're falling into your own love, not in love that's coming to you from out there. Now, yeah, the other person may trigger it. You may see somebody that matches your ideal in a way that it can free you to feel all of that. But the responsibility for feeling and the place of feeling is still in you. 
and the place of recognition. That's what he's talking about. It's not a commodity to go get from somebody. It is an opportunity and an energy and a livingness that you give to the world and to somebody. Love is about giving, not about getting. You know, we, we talk about this being a, a teaching of circulation. And, and just as with prosperity and all the other things, there is a circulation. It is a giving of love and there is a receptivity to it as well. It's not enough just to give. You've got to be open to receive. Some of us aren't. Some of us have trouble with that receiving side because it requires us to be vulnerable. Don't like that part. And if you've had any history or experience with being feeling hurt by vulnerability, then we tend to protect against that. But if we can let that go and just enjoy being loved, then we can enjoy giving love. But this is one of those that's a little different than prosperity because you can't start, well, it's actually the same as prosperity, you can't start on the receiving side if you want to up your ante in love, if you want to up your ante in prosperity. You start on the giving side. You start on that thing where you're giving more to life. You're giving more love. You're being kind. You're loving people, even those you may not like a whole lot. You're finding a way for that love to be an energy and bring you joy in the giving of it, whether they receive it or not. Back to my, don't, don't play the video yet, but Kennedy said one of the things he also did one year was he just stood up in front of us and just stared at us at the beginning of his talk. I'll never forget it. And, so, and finally he said, you wonder what I'm doing? I'm making love to all of you. Well, needless to say, that created a bit of a spurt of energy and, and wonderment and excitement and all sorts of things that can't name here. A little kinkiness too, probably along the way. But the truth of it is that's how love works. We make it and we give it. We make it how? We make it by knowing absolutely who we are. We are born in love. We are the divine expressions of love. When thoughts in my my center of thought, my center of thought, which is heart and head, when that's churning and serving and working, that is the Spirit of God talking through us. That is God's, we are a center of God consciousness. So when you create that love out of yourself and you offer it, you've got to be okay with it coming back to you, perhaps from a whole different place, in a whole different way. When I did that talk back in 1994, and um, in the moments before I walked down the stage, and there were about 300 people in the audience, I think it was in the smaller of the, or it was in the auditorium there. Someone whispered, one of the people introducing me, just or walking me to the stage, whispered in my ear, "Oh, by the way, the flowers today are dedicated to you from your ex." I had the length of time it took the person to tell the audience that to try to get myself back together to walk out front. And at the time, and later on, in talking to friends and therapists and processing it, you know how we do that. We just process and process stuff. They all, some of them had some pretty negative things to say about it. How dare this person do that? And blah, 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 blah. But you know, over, the over time, I had realized, because I knew that person better than anyone else and in a different way than anyone else in the room. And he was sitting right down on the front row where I couldn't miss him. And, and what I now know is that was such a gesture of giving, of love to me from him, of saying, yeah, we didn't make it as a couple. But we did what... Again, our teacher Kennedy Schultz had taught, taught us, and that is keep love alive even if the relationship doesn't last. And that idea of giving and generating love, I took those flowers home and I cried about them and I felt such love and such appreciation and such sadness and disappointment and all of it together. 
And that's kind of what vulnerability of love does. Now, I had complained a lot about how I should be loved, and one of those was getting flowers. So when I did, it was like it took a lot of process to receive it. Now, I'm sharing all that not because of wanting you to just feel sorry or happy for me. It's more about getting thinking about your own loving process and when things have come to you that you didn't expect, and then you go, oh, wait a minute, oh, hmm. Somebody compliments how you look. Oh, this old thing. Well, we don't do that. Because as soon as you say that, you've pushed it away. You've said, no, I don't want that love. I'm saying open to receive, open to receive, and love and give, and find people to love and give. Sometimes when I'm out in the world, in a crowd, or in a, in a place where there are numerous people, I will practice that same thing that Kennedy talked about. I will give love. I'll see people out in the crowd and I just magic, I just imagine that love is coming out of me to them. I learned a long time ago when my very even before I got into this teaching, Ogmandingo's book, The Best Greatest Salesman in the World, which is the beginning of a is a very definitely a new thought book, but at the time it was just a sales book. And I picked it up while I was a minister in my former life, just to try to get to get along with people better. I thought I could use those tricks to get more of them to come into my church. But one of the main things he said in the first part of that book is when you shake hands with anyone, when you greet them and meet them for the first time, just in your heart and in the quietness of your mind, say, I love you and God loves you. Sometimes it's easier to see God loving them than for us to love them, whoever they are especially when they don't agree with us politically or they don't agree with our lifestyle or we don't agree with their lifestyle or any of those other things. But the truth is, I love you. I'm grateful that we are both on the planet right now. And I don't have to put any other things on that. So I've been, it's not as much these days, but there was a while where there was a whole lot of stuff being written about unconditional love and conditional love and sort of love and eternal love. And I mean, on and on it went because, and we can trace that back to the, you know, the Greeks and all their many words for love. I don't think it matters. Love is love is love is love. I don't think there is any love that isn't unconditional. Because then it becomes something else. It becomes trading. It becomes an energy of trade. It becomes an energy of commerce. But true love is unconditional. I love my daughter. I love my grandson. I love the people in my life. I love this group. And it is not conditional on you showing up on a Sunday morning, though I would like for you to. It is not conditional on anything we do or don't do with each other, even, even down to being hurtful or harmful. Sometimes my love is not conditioned on that. Love is love is love is love. It's the one thing and it's one piece. You can't break it apart. One of the things that, that I read this week is, is about in, in reading about relationships. If you don't have a sense of your own loveliness and lovingness and loving power, you really can't give it to anyone else. Think about the love relationships you've had. You know, one of the other one of the other little pieces I'll I'll toss out here, and then I'm I'm going to start wrapping this up, is the idea that love that the equals attract, like attracts like. You've always heard the other opposites attract. Well, opposites don't attract. They don't attract. Opposites don't attract in the in the physical world, in the energetic world, in the in the world of, of physics. None of that. What attracts is like attracts like. You say, yeah, but what about, what about um, 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 magnets? You can't push the two, the two north signs or the N's and the S's. They won't come together. If you put the same one together, they push each other apart. So they don't attract. But if you understand what's happening in that piece of metal, that, that magnet, you know there's a flow of energy that's going through it and coming around and going back in and coming around and coming back in. So when you match something else up to it, you've got to match it so that it's in the same, so the energy can flow in the same direction. So at one level, it looks like opposites are repelling each other. In truth, 
it is lining up so that the energy continues to flow the way it goes. You look deeper. Have you ever gotten into a relationship with somebody who just seemed the opposite of you, could fill all your gaps that were missing, could just be like, oh, yeah. I used to be really attracted to people who were quick deciders because I'm not. I mull through decisions. I go through both sides. I know the best for one of this side and the best for one of that side and what we should do and shouldn't do. And and what you gain and lose if you choose this and you gain it. I mean, it's bo- it drives people crazy. It drives me crazy sometimes. So I, when I wouldn't be the person who was decisive, I thought, well, they do, they do all that that quick and there they go. Ah. Uh-uh. They were just as confused as I was. They just couldn't stand to live in the confusion, so they jumped into decision too fast. We were in this. We were the same, even though on the outside it looked like we were the opposite. Truth is, we weren't. Same issues, same decisions. And as we heal and grow, we attract more people to us who are in, the, who are where we are in our growth and our same and our and our beingness, our sameness for that matter. So I want to leave you with, we've done a lot of sort of random thoughts here about, about relationships and about love. How to create a, a loving relationship is really a simple answer. Love yourself first and love them the same way you love you. That was not just a command from the, the Bible. It is a statement of fact. You can't love anyone else more than you love yourself. It'll always stretch into some sort of weirdness. So I close with the final words from Kennedy Schultz today. All right. The love you seek is already a part of you. The urge you feel is an urge to give it, not to get it. We express it best when we express it freely and wisely. When we express it, we activate a law of cause and effect in the universe of mind. And having activated that law, everything we give must return to us pressed down and overflowing. It will return to us through channels, people, ways that it makes out of itself and for itself. It will not return to us through channels that are closed down to it. It is an activity to be engaged in, not a commodity, be accumulated. It is a verb before it is a noun. It is cause before it is effect. And it is of one piece. Now, you are the thing you see. Get involved in that idea. Get to know that idea. And get to know yourself intimately. There is something there that is wonderful. And I can tell you that without knowing personally any single one of you. In fact, I can tell it you better without personally knowing every single one of you. You are the thing you see. You have it all. You have it all by nature. You enlarge it as you become involved with that idea. Because we evolve as we become involved. Get involved with that idea right here and right now, in mind. Don't run out and get a divorce. Don't run out and get married. Don't run out and do anything on the spur of the moment. And quietly, in that secret place of the sky, begin to realize, to affirm, to think upon these things. You will experience a change in conscience that will lead you to a greater lovingness than at present you or I can. This is the truth, and it's wonderful. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you. You are wonderful. So am I, and so it is. Thank you.